Hello, um, my name is Lindsay Whittle, but I also go by the art identity Sparklezilla, and then I also have another alter ego named Future Lindsay. Uh, I talked a little bit about that in last week's Studio Saturday at the beginning, if you want to watch that. Um, so I'm going to get ready with you. I have my um, cup of coffee, cup of four shots of espresso. That's usually, <laughs> I don't even, I rarely mess with coffee anymore. I like straight up espresso. One of my, um, like a really good friend, who's kind of like a brother to me, gave us a, an espresso machine as a wedding gift and we use it so much. We've used it. Yeah. I wonder how long, I wonder like how long of a life those things have because we use it, but this is my favorite mug. If you, I had it last week too. I don't really care that it's a Starbucks mug. It's more, I love that it's multicolored and I love that it's tall and Flint gave it to me as a gift. So, um, I often, drink uh, drink coffee out of this so if you want to drink coffee with me while I chat or do makeup with me um yeah that can be kind of fun while I talk about art stuff um so I was really surprised last week um I've always my whole life I've struggled with anxiety the last few years I've also had a little bit of struggles with some depression sometimes and you know I mentioned last week that Clint and I have just had a really challenging year and I think that brings a lot of other you know, emotions and stuff with it. So this year, you know, it's been a struggle. I feel like on a scale of one to 10 of like 10 being like just anxiety and depressed and whatever, and one being you're great. I feel like we've been living at an eight this year. So it's not that hard to like flip over into a 10 and just be like totally exhausted and upset and stuff like that. And um, so last Saturday I did studio Saturday and it was like kind of a rush. Like I just got so much done and I was so energized. Like I said, I never even like wanted to take a break to go to the bathroom or eat. I was just, I think it's that, um, with ADHD, like hyperfixation, I can use that as a superpower. And I just always have so many irons in the fire and so many things I have to juggle and, um, just, oops, sorry. I pressed the mute button. <laughs> Oh, technology. Um, just the idea that I could like commit all my thoughts and energy, like that I have this like eight hour window where I don't have to think about anything else but my work. I didn't put that pressure on myself to think about anything else but art. And I don't know, it was literally like, so for the next two days, I was still like so productive and still on that rush, um, which is like not my normal. My normal is often just like stress and chaos and, um, <laughs> just so many things to do uh you know um and I was just like so anyways I'm really curious this experiment to see the law you know anytime you're doing a repetitive duration habit-based activity so I'm saying like every Saturday at least for the summer who knows maybe I'll continue it I'm gonna do this like one thing and see how it goes um, there's always like results that surprise you so I'm interested to see and you know Clint and I talked about it because I also was going through all the New York documentation last week, which I'm going to do today. And I think that also like filled me with a lot of energy to have like all those, like, all that excitement and art thoughts like back in my mind. And then I've been like meditating a lot lately. Like, I felt like there's a lot of factors. It's not just this Saturday thing, but I think that was a big factor. So I'm really curious. Um, I guess I should start doing my makeup too. Um, Cause I just want to chat. I know it's so weird to see plain old fresh out of bed Lindsay I have a um like a onesie bodysuit on that I here I can show a little bit more that one of my prints is on it but um right now I have jeans over it but it's a whole bodysuit because I think I'm gonna do a happening today when I was doing time art diaries which was that performance um this is my my lotion my fancy lotion. It's like $20, which is way more. I mean, I'm sure people spend way more than that on, I know like skincare routines are like really important to people and I wish I was better at it, but, um, you know, I feel like $7 on lotion was usually how I maxed out, but then I found this stuff and it just feels like heaven on my skin. So it's like 20 or $25 for it, but it like, it's, I don't know. It's like, I don't need much. Like it's just got a lot of kick. Um, I love it. And like I said, I always put it down my neck too. So today I have, uh, as usual, I'm over ambitious because I think most artists are, they always want to get more done um, than possible. 
So um, some stuff I have on my list today, I want to do some more New York processing from the residency I did last summer. Uh, if I have time, I might want to, I've been wanting to do uh, making shoes and hats to make myself super tall is one of my longer term projects. Um, it's future Lindsay's shape language but I also because I have a shape language with Lorraine Wibble that's a 3D shape language and I didn't even know I didn't think in 3D until Lorraine challenged me to do that um, but so I, I think I would use her shape language to make the hats and shoes and I love this idea of overlapping to me shape languages are collaboration languages which is like the space between me and another person that is a big part of my mind it it allows me to um acknowledge all the people present in my work it also allows me to sort of like spend time with them even when they're not near and like things that matter to them and uh it also helps me engage in my primary concept which is teamwork um so I've just put some foundation on I talked about this last week but they no longer make this it's for sensitive skin because I have crazy sensitive skin it's from CoverGirl and Clint and I found like a bunch of them at a flea market I literally bought like 30 or 40 so I'm going to use them till they till they run out but um yeah, and then I have to find something new. So that's usually, I mean, I don't like to spend a ton of time getting ready. But also, I was thinking about this, you know, I didn't really mention this last week, that I have these wearable projects that I do. For some reason, you know, in the, when I, for some reason, I tend to lean on them being about a year. Um, I don't know why. I don't know why I've started, like, that that's like, yeah, maybe at some point I need to challenge that duration because I think it's becoming too too comfortable for me that I always do these wearable projects for a year. Um, so like, but, but that's not true actually because the last wearable project, I probably ended up doing it for two and a half years. I'm not sure. But so before, so right now I'm wearing paper every day for a year like I did in 2013. And then before that I was wearing chain mail um, and like linked together and apparatuses and things uh chain mail made by my friend sky kubakub of rebirth garments um and before that i did neoprene and I, it goes way back but i do these like wearable projects that it's a kind of the most basic way that i like sketch ideas and bring my art out of my out of art spaces and into my everyday life because when i wear this stuff at like the grocery store or wherever i'm like having conversations about my work um so yeah, it's like a big, it's like, and it's been there since, like, since I went to art school, I was doing this, like the, my, like I started with sort of like literal costumes when I went to art school, I would be like a ballerina and then a power ranger and then a chef or whatever. And then it, it started shifting into all these different wearable projects. But I bring all this up because I, in grad school, um, I did a specific wearable project where I was doing weird makeup. Like I didn't really pay attention to what my was on my body. So for one semester, because I had been primarily focusing as the wearable project on like stuff on the body. And then I did one semester where I just focused on the face. So like just whole face makeups. Um, and it was funny. So this was right after my first year of paper, which was in 2013. And when I would wear paper every day, people would often ask me, what are you supposed to be? Because I guess they thought it was like a costume. And I'd be like, I don't know myself. What are you supposed to be? <laughs> like, it was such an interesting question. And then when I did makeup every day for a semester, um, everybody would always ask me, what are you celebrating? And I thought that was interesting, too, that I guess people assumed it was like face paint or something, because these were like whole face makeups and so again I thought that was interesting that that's this place that everybody goes and I would just be like oh I'm celebrating that it's Tuesday you know because I didn't really it wasn't I mean I guess I am always trying to celebrate the little things in life but in that instance it wasn't something specific that's actually my first sip of coffee of the day sometimes I feel like my brain needs it <laughs> to come alive um so as as time went on I started to integrate makeup like at first I wanted it to like be related to the outfits and sometimes it is, um, you know, like, and it's interesting too, because sometimes I let ideas carry between wearable projects. So like, you know, I remember I wore glasses, my glasses sculptures on my head, but I moved it from the neoprene into the chain mail because I just didn't feel like I was done with that idea. So sometimes I'll let stuff carry through, even though I've made like the 
the structure like I sort of have this like underlying structure like right now no matter what I'm gonna have paper on right um so like before I was wearing neoprene tied up and then I was wearing the chain mail but I still wore the glasses sculptures even though because that was more like I just was trying to understand it was about being taller it was about you know the the fact that they could be glasses and hats and performance objects like it was and I just wasn't done I just needed to keep thinking about it um but the same with makeup you know like a lot of the chainmail project, I wore stickers on my face. Um, and that actually kind of evolved out of uh, COVID, out of wearing a mask, because um, the, like when I had the mask on, I, so I started doing makeup just up here because you couldn't even see down here. But then also like sometimes like heat and moisture would kind of leak out of the mask and then the makeup would run. So I would um, wear stickers on my face because that was a way to bring prints to my face. Um, but also it like wouldn't run. And what's interesting is I've learned that if you you have to put makeup on before you put stickers on or it like hurts, I mean, hurts to peel that thing back off. Yeah, so last summer when I was still wearing the chain mail, I wore the stickers every day. And then I started to make these interesting, um, <clears throat> it's not close to me or I would show you, but I started making these interesting, I would take the stickers off and put them on paper to see what kind of compositions I could make with the stickers that I'd worn. And when I first started wearing paper, I was gluing a lot of paper to my face and I still do sometimes, but I also just have really been enjoying um, putting makeup asymmetrically on my face. And I don't know, yeah, I don't know what it is, but I know that I wanna do it and I'm just gonna trust it. Um, so yeah, so I wear the paper, but I've also been doing this makeup strategy, this kind of like gem in the holograms. <laughs> I mean, it's not always like I did last week where it's like a black eye, but it's sort of like a big area around the eye that I do makeup. Um, yeah, it's interesting. When I was in fashion school, I glued a lot of stuff to my face and I would have like a string glued to my face or a coin or something. And people would go like, they'd say like, you have something on your face. And I'd be like, oh, you know, I glued it there. And they'd be like, what? Um, and even, you know, because Clint and I have been married for a while, we'll get ice cream and I'll have like a big blob of chocolate or ice cream on my face because I'm a messy eater. And Clint will be like, "Not he won't tell me. And I'm like, Clint, why didn't you tell me I had ice cream all over my face? And he'll say like, oh, I just thought you did it on purpose because I do often put weird stuff on my face on purpose. But another thing I did when I was in fashion school is I was interested in how, like, you know, when, like, especially some eyeshadows, they're like bronze and gold, and um, they can, they kind of look like dirt, right? Like, not on your eyes. Like, when they're on your eyes, they don't look like dirt. But when they're, when it's just, like, in that palette, or if you rub it on something, it just looks like a patch of dirt. So I was really curious how like when you put this dirt like color substance powder on your eyes, it's considered makeup. But so I would take like this, you know, I would have like a palette that would be like browns and bronzes or whatever. And I would just rub some of it and like just put it on my face. And um, people would go like, oh, my gosh, you've got dirt on your face. And I'm like, oh, it's makeup. And they just go like, oh, like they get really upset. <laughs> it was really funny. Um, so anyways, I like, I've, I've always like liked playing with the role of makeup and like that we have these zones, like as long as it's on the lips and the eyes and like the cheekbones, it's like, okay, <laughs> I don't know. Like I've always been interested in this. Um, oops, I forgot to do my eyebrows again. See, it's interesting how I really have a hard time talking and doing makeup, which is funny because I feel like, you know, I'm a full-time teacher. I feel like I have to multitask all the time but maybe because it's early so I did actually sh you know trim up and shave my eyebrows for everybody this week since I noticed it hardcore last week so um the first time I ever shaved my eyebrows I was in New York or not New York I was in Chicago and um the the collaborator I work with that does my hair Terry Palmer I've, I really never let anybody but her cut my hair. Even when I lived in Japan, I would like fly home, have her do my hair, fly back. And then when I lived in Chicago, I would drive home, have her do my hair and I'd go back. But it, when I lived in Chicago, I had the, I, it wasn't colored, it was brown, but I had the sides shaved. And sometimes I would um, kind of like it that the, normally I don't have it be that triangle shape, but I kind of like it. 
there was this guy and he had just moved to the U.S. He actually didn't speak that much English. And he was in a salon that was in my building because sometimes I would need the sides like shaved, um, you know, just freshened up. They would get pretty long. And so I would go into the salon and have him shave it, but I would be really insistent that he couldn't cut the long hair part. He could only shave the sides and he would get mad. And I was like, it's nothing against you. It's like about this person that I work with and I, it's a space that I saved for her. Um, but so he started to get really creative. Sometimes he would shave these like super intricate designs into the side of my head. It was interesting because, you know, like I said, his English was, he was learning, but uh, from what I could understand, he was some kind of a like hair celebrity where he had come from. Um, just as a reminder, I use lip stains to put on my face, which I'm sure makeup people like all scream at the same time when they find that out. Um, but it was because I have a lot of experience of using like powder makeup and sets and it would just melt off my face. It would never stay. Um, so anyways, this guy was some kind of a hair celebrity where he was from and he you know, moving here, he, that wasn't the case here so far. I'm sure, you know, he was very talented. I'm sure he's on the way to do that. But at the time he was like feeling really frustrated. So he would really make these incredible designs. And then one day he just started shaving into my eyebrows without even discussing it with me. He just did it. And I was like, oh, okay. I'm changing my mind on what color I want to use. Um, so often, I'll, so how I decide to make choices here. Sometimes I'll just like, especially if I'm in a hurry, I'll just like do stuff. But a lot of times I like to use the outfit that I'm wearing to like influence my choices. It just kind of feels like it brings it all together. So I've been looking at like these shapes and these shapes and they're not, you know, it's not like exact, but I just like to use it as a starting point. Um, but so that was in what, like 2013. He just randomly one day started shaving shapes into my eyebrows. And at first I was like, what? And then I was like, hmm. Um, and that's what I always tell the, so Terry Palmer, the person who does my hair, um, you know, she, cause I'm literally just like, she doesn't tell me anything. She just does stuff because she could totally shave it all off and I wouldn't care. Like, but same thing with the eyebrows. I was like, huh. And then I ended up really loving it. And I've been doing it ever since because, um, I love asymmetry. I love having two different shaped eyebrows. There's a lot more communication potential when you aren't so focused on symmetry. I'm liking this so far. So I was thinking today, I'm going to do some, I'm going to glue some stuff on my face because I was just talking about it. But before I do that, because I clearly cannot do makeup and talk. So stuff I was thinking about working on today are... New York processing, the super tall hat and shoe stuff. Uh, I'm going to do a happening sketch. I think I started to talk about that, that. And that's why I'm wearing the bodysuit that when I was doing time art diaries in the spring on Saturdays, we talked a lot about happenings and I did one in my kitchen and I was like, wow, like doing a happening. It almost feels like meditation. Like it just really puts me in the moment and makes me feel alive and, um, so a happening, it's, it's a little bit different. You know, a performance is often very planned. It doesn't have to be, but often is. A happening, it was specific to, uh, Alan Capra coined that term. And it's sort of, uh, it's a little bit different from performances in the sense that it's very environment-based. You're often reacting to the stuff around you, the people that are around you. Um, it's often in the moment, there are like no rehearsals, like you're just doing stuff. It's not scripted. Um, so it's, you know, and, and then later, um, Andy Warhol had a lot of happenings where it was just people doing stuff in the moment, reacting to the space, to people around you. So to me, a happening doesn't really have a lot of like planning. You're just reacting. Um, so when I did Time Art Diaries, I was like, I should start doing happenings like as a form of meditation where I'm just like reacting to stuff in a space and just, you know, just for fun um, and just to like get my mind in the zone. And I can't do it in peak right now, but I think peak is the gallery that my husband and I co-run. But I think once we um, open it back up for events in September, I might try to do like 
open happenings where people could just come and do this weird stuff with me. But that's why I'm wearing this bodysuit and that's on my list today. I'm also going to read to the John Cage plant again, some more from the Dick Higgins book. Um, and I'll try to do some processing from Time Art Diaries, even if it's just five minutes. Uh, I might work on some stuff for Cincinnati Comic Con. Clint and I are both working towards that. And that's like anytime I'm doing stuff with Clint, that feels like my shape language with him. Um, Cause I like to at least work on, I have 25 current active shape languages i hope i hope i have so many someday but um like i hope this is a project i just keep digging into but you never i don't know i I try not to overthink it i try not to add those like time structures like i'm just gonna let this project go wherever it needs to go um but i try to like i like to try to work on one or two every time i'm working doing art stuff uh I have some fun like play sewing I want to do like I want to um, I have like so many fabric scraps and I just want to like make a giant piece of fabric from all my fabric scraps and then I want to make these weird like I'm calling them summer moo's, but they're prettier than that but I have this one moo type thing that like cinches at the waist because it's tied that I wear a lot because it's like breezy and comfortable but it's also cool looking so I think I want to make some of those but I also have some pants I'm working on. Like, they're just like fun things to wear, but like free sewing where I'm not overthinking it can be so fun. And also this week I made a new pant sloper for myself. So I might make a pants pattern too. I don't know. Um, so I have this like giant list. I have like a week's worth of stuff that I want to do today. And so I'll probably like triage and go with what I want to do first um, and see how it goes. I'm not going to put too much pressure on myself. So I'm going to glue... So I was thinking about how when I'm processing all the footage from New York and stuff um, that I've been crocheting these blobs from streamers. So even though this isn't paper, I thought it would be fun since these Studio Saturday makeups are a little bit different because I'm doing them to be productive. Like I just stay home and work. I'm not going out and being Sparklezilla. I'm like just working at home. Um, I like to, I like these Studio Saturdays to be a little bit more play based. Um I like Karita Kent. She said the best way to be an artist is to engage in plork, which is play plus work. Uh, we talk about that a lot with my freshmen. So my first year. So pl I'm plorking. But anyway, so I would like to glue some of these to my face. So I have my trusty spirit gum. Um, spirit gum is what they use in like theater and things to, you know, any kind of performances to glue stuff to the face. This stuff is legit. So don't buy the stuff unless you buy this stuff which is spirit gum remover because it feels like if you've ever like touched super glue and then there's just like, it feels like there's like a scab or something on your finger for many days. And it's really annoying. That's what this feels like, but it's on your face. So when you like do weird face, facial expressions, I don't use paint brushes for spirit gum because it ruins them. I mean, literally whatever spirit gum touches, it just becomes this stiff glue mess. Um, so I have this paper clip. Sometimes I use popsicle sticks or whatever. Um, so I literally am just going to like stick it in here to get enough glue that it drips. And then ooh, I'm going to put a little bit in the back. You don't need that much. I try to, you know, it's too wet at first. It doesn't stick if it's too wet. So I kind of like wave it around a little bit. And that would love how that reflects the light. I've honestly, I've glued a lot of things to my face. I've not glued streamers. So I'm happy you're here with me today to experience this. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm just putting, I just put enough to put, like, I'm just, I don't know if you can see this. Probably not. Oh yeah. So not too much, just a little bit. But I honestly, I like it when things stick up off my face. Yeah, like see how that's kind of like flapping up. So I could like slick it down. Like I could put glue on the whole thing. So I have five different colors here. I just thought this would be fun. So I do have a paper if I glue stuff to my face during this wearable project that I stick this stuff on later. So that's if it doesn't fall off. Usually spear comes pretty strong, but you know, I'm going to be doing happenings and stuff. So who knows? Oh my gosh, I love, watch this. I love when it reflects off my face. That's so good. So if there's, if it's all still on my face at the end of the day, I'm going to glue it to my paper that I keep track of all the stuff I glue to my face. <laughs> Don't we all have a paper for the stuff we glue to our face? Um, so I had like promised myself I wasn't going to make this too long today, but I think with me being distracted by talking and doing makeup and that I first wake up and I have a hard time 
making sense of things. It's still gone long, but I do want to tell two stories before I go and have a studio day. Um, the first is I watched a documentary this week on Namjoon Pike. It's called um, The Moon is the Oldest TV, I think. It was on PBS. I'd been waiting and waiting for this to come out. So anybody that knows me knows that like I've been pursuing researching John Cage for since like 2016 as sort of like a personal research project of just like so then I just throw this paper clip away um when I started teaching performance art and I would research these performance artists to demo in my class and almost every single time it would be like student of John Cage student of John Cage I was like not everybody can be a student of John Cage but they kind of were and and then I was like how like what the hell happened in his classes that he was able to create so many contemporary performance artists? Specifically his class experimental composition at the new school, like multiple art movements were born in that class. And then so many famous artists came out of that class, like Happenings and Fluxus came out of that class. You know, Namjoon Pike started with is sort of seen as the father of video art and that you know, came out of a connection with John Cage, which was, you know, Namjoon Pike was also considered a Fluxus artist and, um, you know, Charlotte Mormon and Allison Knowles and Dick Higgins, like uh, Yoko Ono, all these amazing people were kind of pulled back to him into that class. And so I've done a lot of research on that class because I want to know, like, from the point of view of an educator of like, what do you need to put into a class to like light a fire in your students? Because that's what he did. Uh, but the more you study John Cage, it's like taking two steps forward and 40 steps backwards because... I don't know, John Cage was kind of like Yoda, like he, I don't think he would ever want you to receive direct communication from him. I think he would want you to like, not understand and make you think more deeper and more critically and be curious. And so even the way he writes, it's like, it's like written, often written like a music score. So even like the pace of how you read it feels different. And then he writes, in, he sort of created his own way of writing, honestly. Uh, but he writes in a way that like takes a lot for you to process and digest it. And so anyway, so I watch every documentary ever on all the Fluxus artists because I feel like I'm just circling all this information. But I had been waiting for this Namjoon Pike documentary to come out. Namjoon Pike has a lot of connections to um, Cincinnati. He did a lot of stuff with Carl Solway Gallery uh, because John Cage and Carl Solway were friends. And um, there's a big robot in downtown Cincinnati that the CAC has. It's like the one piece of art they own. And that's in Namjoon Pike. And when I had a show there, my name was like on the robot. So cool. So this Namjoon Pike documentary, um, he talks about before Cage and after Cage. He called it BC. Like he was like Namjoon Pike was like a composer until he was in Germany. And John Cage had come over and done a concert with a few other people and they had clips of this concert, which I had never seen before. And I was like blown away. And, he, you know, John Cage was like making sounds with a typewriter and somebody else was like hitting a piano, making all these weird sounds with a piano. So it was very much like a sound collage and less of like a traditional concert. But it had been like tickets had been sold as like Americans doing a concert, you know, so it was a full auditorium of people who had come to see like a classical idea of music. And then they came and heard all this crazy stuff. So, you know, Namjoon Pike said, and you could see in the footage, people were like booing and leaving, like getting the heck out of there. And they just kept playing and kept pursuing their interest. And I was telling this to a few students this week too, because it was really on my mind that like, you know, I think all artists struggle with self-doubt. I struggle with self-doubt constantly. And this idea that you would be on stage and being actively booed and everybody's getting out of there and you're still like you believe in the work and you're just seeing it through and you don't let that phase you. But that was the moment that Namjoon Pike was born. Like, I don't even think Namjoon Pike would have become an artist or or explored video or any of the things he did in his life if he hadn't seen that concert. And that's why he always said before Cage and after Cage, because he was a traditional composer in music school. And then he saw that concert and then he became an artist. So I thought that was really cool. And then the other thing I wanted to talk about, and I'm going to brush my hair. I mentioned last week, I often will also use dry shampoo, but I actually water washed my hair recently. So I don't think I'm quite at the dry shampoo zone yet, <laughs> but I am going to brush it. It's funny though. I'll brush it and then I'll like do that. <laughs> so I like brush it and tangle it. Um, and then I'm going to put some lip stuff on and my look is pretty much done. Like I said, if I was going to go out, I would like put a bunch of jewelry on. I have a few 
holes in my earlobes. I can put a lot of earrings on, put necklace on, put a lot of paper on, but that wouldn't, you know, I want to get a lot of stuff done today and that would slow me down. So I'm just kind of going to do um, makeup on these studio Saturdays. But so the other story I want to tell is Clint and I, um, this spring worked a lot on a project uh, with the dance group in Cincinnati called Pones on this project called Keeping Your Torch. It was for the Fringe Festival in Cincinnati. And for this project, they interviewed 19 people. Well, they did 19 interviews. Some of them were couples. So, so there was more than 19 people, but there were 19 interviews. And they were between like, like two and three hours long, some of them. So it was quite an investment. And it, so then Pones worked with a few visionaries to do five performances inspired by these interviews. And some people did themes, some people did a few different interviews in true Lindsay and Clint fashion. We wanted to do all, we wanted to reference all 19 interviews because we're crazy people. And I went into it kind of like, okay, I have to watch all these interviews so I can get this project done. But then about halfway through the project, like watching all these interviews, I could see that it was really starting to like impact and change me because it really made me think about what kind of person do I want to become as I continue to age. And I loved that the overarching theme became to like never stop dreaming, never stop learning, never stop trying new things. Because I feel like when you're young, everybody's like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Where do you want to go? And then when you become an adult, people stop asking you about your dreams. There's less of an encouragement to dream, but that became that theme. And it was really impactful to Clint and I. So Clint worked on the music. So he also had to watch the interviews so that he could find these sound bites. Cause he, he made like a sound collage of the interviewees talking. And, um, and then he also layered up like music and sound and I added some sounds and it was awesome. Um, but so it took us like, it took me like a month and a half to watch all the interviews. And then I designed a textile based on the interviews, a few different textiles. And it had a lot of the people, it had everybody, everybody that was interviewed had their face on the textile because we really wanted to celebrate and honor all the people that had been interviewed. And, um, so this, and then we had to, I made these four abstract kimono pieces and then. Clint helped me make these sculptures that came to the body. It was like a three act performance. So this piece took months. I mean, it took, it was, it was literally like hundreds and hundreds of hours on this piece. But like I mentioned last week, it had just been such a challenging year for Clint and I, that it kind of became a lifeline for me, like to just turn my mind off to the stresses and just like make stuff that I believed in. Like, I just, I really needed it. Um, but so anyways, there was like, five or six performances. I don't know why I'm blanking on how many there were for Fringe. And we went to one of them last Tuesday and we we really had a great time. And we went with my mom, Clint and I did. Um, and then last night was the last show and Clint and I went to go pick up the props because it was like this interesting space where performances were happening back to back and you really had to like get everything out quickly so that the next performance could start. So our last, the Keeping Our Torch ended, um, at eight o'clock and we had to just like get the stuff and go. So Clint and I showed up to grab the four kimonos and the eight props that we had made. <laughs> I had an itch on my foot. And um, we, so we're standing there cause we were gonna talk to some of the people in the show before we left. And um, all of a sudden, some of the people that had been interviewed started walking out. They had all come together on like a bus from there where they were living. Uh, at first I saw one or two and then literally I think I saw like 10 but what was so cute is like Clint and I you know we had spent so much time with these interviews and studying these people to try to like represent them uh, and to us they were kind of like celebrities like I was like Clint, oh my gosh like we were like freaking out <laughs> uh, and so they walked up and they were they had, they saw that we were holding these costumes like we weren't in the performance but we were holding the costumes so they were like talking to us about it and I was like, oh, your faces are on these. And they were like, what? And so we opened them up and we're showing them where all their faces were. And they were like, they were like so touched and so excited. And they were taking, we were like holding up the fabric and they were like taking selfies with it and stuff. And it just like, it made their day and it made Clint and I's day that it made their day. And they were just 
you know, they were talking to us about their interviews and I was telling them like how much they had impacted us and how it reminded me to like keep dreaming. And, and we were thanking them for their interviews and they were thanking us for the performance and they were so excited to see the fabric. And it was just one of the, it, I don't know. I, I feel like as an artist, you make all this work and you hope it impacts people, but you like put it in a museum or a gallery or whatever. And you don't really, I mean, what was nice when I had my show at the CAC is I became friends with all the security guards and they would often tell me the reactions that were people were happening, that was happening with people. So that was cool. But I feel like a lot of times you don't know, you know, like lots of people saw this show and that was another great thing. When Clint and I went, we heard this one woman like on the same row as us who didn't know us. She was like, when our piece was done, she was like, that was beautiful. And then, um, when we were carrying the costumes out last night, Clint heard like a similar comment where somebody said something like, well, that piece was wonderful or something. So, you know, all these people saw it and I hope that they were positively impacted by it, but you don't really know. And to get to meet the people that we made the piece for, like this was all about them and to see them be so like touched by it. Like, so it was like another one of those things where Clint and I showed up to go pick up these props because it was like an errand we needed to do. <laughs> And then we, I just left like on a high, like, I was just like, oh my gosh, you know, we got to meet all these people and they were really impacted. And that was really cool. Um, so I talked way more than I had planned on as usual, but I'm going to go have a crazy fun studio day and then I'll, um, I'll follow up. <laughs> I'll come back and record how it all went like I did last week and then but what I didn't say last week is that if anybody wants to comment on things they want me to talk about or if if you just want to say like these videos are too long you need to talk faster and have less ADHD I can do what I can but I can't promise anything but yeah I'm happy to hear if anybody watches this if it um yeah, if there's anything you want to see or anything you want me to change but if you notice and I noticed it last week when I was editing this video that I felt like my brain was a lot more less scattered at the end of the day, just because I think when I first wake up, it's like I have to get my kick my brain into gear. So, yeah, I'll see you later today. OK, so it is 445 um, and I'm going to kind of I got to like a stopping point. So I was like, OK, I'm going to go record a follow up and then I honestly might go back to making stuff because I was like just starting to have a lot of fun in my studio so we'll I don't know we'll see I st last week when I did this I had I had no energy by five o'clock but I'm still I mean I don't know if it's the espresso I've been sipping or what I'm still kind of rolling so I might see where this leads me but um so yeah same hella productive day um so I'm really loving like the way these Saturdays are going and how it sets off the rest of my week so we'll see um, so yeah, I did, I processed the video for weeks four and five of the residency. And that really surprised me because, uh, there was some drama <laughs> in those weeks. And it was interesting to watch like in this one video, cause it's two weeks, like there's all this drama and I'm really emotional. And then by the end of the video, there's resolution and everything's fine. And I just had like a couple of challenging situations happen. <clears throat> at the end of the semester slash beginning of the summer. Um, and, you know, you always overanalyze how you react to things and stuff. So it felt very like, I don't know, maybe I just have to get emotional every summer. I don't know. It felt very like, um, it was just interesting for me to watch this unfold. Um, but yeah, again, like I felt so energized by revisiting some of the stuff I worked on last summer and just all the crazy stuff, you know, in this particular video, I like flew home in the middle of the residency and went to this opening at the CAC that Peak was in and like did all this stuff and then like flew back and then had an exhibition. It was just crazy. So, and then I made my map collages for weeks four and five. I'm looking at my list here. If you see me looking, um, I read to the plant which is growing like crazy again. So I'm just convinced that this plant just needs to learn about performance art once a week and then it thrives. So I read some more of the Dick Higgins book and I read some of a John Cage autobiography. And here, let me read some of these quotes. It was shocking. Um, so I've heard this before, but it was nice to write it down. So John Cage said that to him, the perp he learned this from a singer, an Indian singer named Gira Sarabhai. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce her name, but it 
the, so we learned this from her. The purpose of music is to sober and quiet the mind, thus making it susceptible to divine influences. John Cage talked about how he ran out of money. He did this performance and not enough people came. And then he like ran out of money and he had to ask for help. And, and that's always really relatable for me when really famous artists are like struggling. I also found a list of John Cage's um, like books that he read about Zen Buddhism, which I'm really excited to check out. Um he said he was a ground so that, so to speak, oh, he was a ground, so to speak, which emptiness could grow from. I thought that was kind of crazy. Um, oh, he used to use the I Ching to compose music. This was in response to how Buddhism has influenced his work. He used the I Ching for chance operations to compose music because it made his responsibility that of asking questions instead of making choices. That was awesome. Um, so yeah, so I had some great reading moments with the plant. And then, um, so that performance I mentioned earlier that we had made kimonos and props for that we picked up last night, I had made those props, you know, it took a long time to make them and I didn't really get to play with them. A lot of the times when I make stuff, then what, as soon as it's made, then I start learning what it wanted to be. <laughs> so the dancers explored two shapes each in the performance and they were beautiful and phenomenal and I loved it, but I really wanted to see what would happen if I put them all on. And I still have, a, I still have some things I want to explore with this, but this was a good like first step. Um, so I tried putting them all on. It was really hard to put them on myself. And then I tried Clint putting them all on. So I like made some music really quick and then did kind of like a happening with these pieces. And it was really fun. Um, so I might continue to do these happening meditations on studio Saturdays. Cause that was really cool. Uh, we turned our guest room into a happening space and our cat freaked out because we were moving all this furniture and he was kind of part of the happening um, I did, I looked into some tasks I want to do with my shape languages. I worked on a blob while I was editing, um, the video from the residency. And I also, um, uh, I'm making some pants. So I worked on the pattern and cut the first layer after I edit this video, I'm going to try to print out the pockets that I'm going to do. Um, and I organized some fabric scraps that I want to sew together to make a big fabric so I can start making weird moo moos. <laughs> I know I'm a weirdo. I mean, I didn't get to everything on my list. I feel like that's like the way life is though. And what's nice is I can like let the, the what I didn't get to roll into next week. Although I found after last Saturday, I worked more on my art in just little ways throughout the week. So I don't know, maybe I'll get to some of the things on this list throughout the week. This felt like an epiphany to me. I'm realizing how, you know, because I have ADHD, like hyper fixating has always been something I do. Like, I love to have a moment where I can just hyper fixate on something and not be distracted and stretched. And it made me wonder if I can like carve out more zones like this, where like I have a day where I'm doing what I call adulting, like stuff like taxes and things, that, you know, bills, things I don't want to do. Like I could have like a zone, like I could have an assigned time for that and assigned time for cleaning, which I actually do kind of enjoy cleaning. I just never make time for it. Um, and assigned time for, um, I'm always brainstorming side hustles, especially because we've had to brainstorm some stuff with peak lately. So like I call this time jobbing where I'm like brainstorming side hustles, but I'm also, um, you know, like working on listing our stuff online and prepping for comic conventions where we make sales. So it's sort of like a business side of things. So having like a business chunk of time and then a chunk of time to do some writing, uh, a chunk of time for social media. So I was like brainstorming that a little bit, like, because I've had so much success with this sort of like eight to five studio Saturday. I'm wondering if I can like, I don't know, experiment. I'm not going to put too much pressure on myself, but experiment on my week and see if I can chunk more hyperfixation times on topics. But I don't know if I'm going to have as much energy, like I have so much energy for these studio Saturdays and I don't know if I'm going to have as much energy for like adulting time. <laughs> we will see, but that's the beauty of an experiment, right? Um, 
I decided I'm going to make like a big book and or photo book from all my New York documentation because it's just so vast and so much amazing stuff happened from it. I think I'm mostly making it for me, but if somebody else wants a copy, that's fine. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Because first I want to get through all these videos and get those posted and then I'm going to start mining. It literally might take me six months to a year to get through all of this New York documentation, but it's like it's just like giving me so much hope and energy processing it all. So I'm like, it's, I'm excited to work on it. Um, I don't normally put vulnerable things out there in the video I cut today for the residency was had a pretty vulnerable moment in there. So that's a little bit, but I think if you're not a little bit scared of what you're doing, you're probably not, you know, you're not pushing yourself. Like I'm, so I don't know, we'll see. I'll put it out there and we'll see. I can always take it down. Sorry. I just hit my computer. I'm just skimming my notes. Oh, so I have been doing this project this year where I'm trying to read 108 books. I used to never be a reader. Uh, as a kid, my mom had to like read my books to me in school so I didn't fail. Like I maybe read one book a year. I read a book by Jim Quick in 2019 called Limitless Mind. I think that's the name of it. And it changed how I started to think about the brain and learning. And then I took his speed reading class. And last year, between New York and December, I read 46 books, which shocked me. Well, I also, I mix it up with audiobooks, but I think that in my mind, it still counts. You're, and it's interesting because the brain in, receives information differently from listening than reading. And I like, it's almost like exercising. Like I like working out those part of my brains where I become more efficient at receiving information. Like I've lately started to play my audiobooks faster and my brain is processing that information, which is exciting for me. And then I also fill out book reports for all my books so I can teach myself to be a good critical thinker. <laughs> you know, um, I'll go over, maybe, ne maybe in a future studio Saturday, I'll show my book reports because they're ridiculous. <laughs> um, but so... I I have this thing where in the last 80% of a book, that's where all the craziest stuff happens. And I usually can't put it down once it's at 80%. So I have to be very careful about when I hit 80% because I like won't get anything done. I'll just like read a book. And I try to do it at night so I can just like read it and fall asleep. And I wanted to finish the book I'm listening to right now. I wanted to finish it um, last night and I didn't get to. And so I was like really stressed that I was going to just, you know, like not work on my studio Saturday stuff and that I would instead try to read this book. And I didn't try to read the book, which like that just shows how excited I was about studio Saturday that I didn't try to finish the book. I did. It's I, later in the day. I put it in my headphones while I was working because I I will often check out an audiobook and an ebook from the library and I'll go back and forth because I love I love reading and listening. So uh, and it just suits different things throughout the day. But there were parts of my day where I couldn't put it in my headphones because I was getting too emotional and I needed to like focus. Um, it's this author. I've read her many times and I'm in the middle book of a three book series and I knew she was going to break my heart at the end of the book. So I was like, oh, I need to like space this out so I don't get too emotional. Um, so that was interesting to me that I didn't even have the craving to finish the book and I was in the last 80% because I was so excited about Studio Saturday. But so I was thinking about how now that I'm technically out of Studio Saturday, cause it's like, it's five, but I might still work in my studio a little bit. I might just like sew some fabric and just little stuff. But I was like, oh, I might just put on like a bad TV show instead of like a book on tape or music or podcast because now it's like off time. So isn't that so funny that my mind like segregates, like you can't watch a TV show during Studio Saturdays you have to listen to a book on tape or listen to music or <laughs> I just think the human brain is so funny. Um, so yeah, I think that kind of covers a lot of it. Um, it was, it's been fun to do these two Saturdays. I'm going to keep working on talking less and getting these shorter, but the, I'm a gabber. It's not my strong suit. So, uh, anybody that's stuck around this far, it's been fun hanging out with you. And let me know in a comment if there's anything you want me to specifically work on or talk about, because I'm always open to trying weird stuff. I will put the footage from the happening at the end of this video, um, happenings, because I did two different experiments. Um, 
So stick around if you want to see that. I'll put like I'll put like a rushed version on my TikTok if you want to see like a 30 second version of it. And I'll put the whole thing um, at the end of this video. So yeah, see you next Saturday, same time. And well, I probably won't post this till Sunday. So see you next Sunday, same time, same channel. <laughs>